pushing through the dark clouds Freezing us out, I can't get up when you're low down We're all getting rained on, wish we were the same cause You always make my days golden But when the sun shines through your face It looks more like you, spirits that will be singing Hey, hey, and we act our age Love to just Everything said was much too much for me today I'm getting rained on, but I know who to call on You always make my days go friends and fellow music fans. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight on our second uh, IVW In Conversation With. Um, tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome our guest, um, CEO of one of the biggest ticketing companies in the world. That's it, I like, like drum roll please. <laughs> um, Rob Wilmshurst of Sea Tickets. Thank welcome. you, thanks for having me. Yeah, welcome to the Boiler Room. Welcome to Guildford, my first <laughs> Yeah, time. welcome to Guildford too, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, yeah, you haven't been here before, actually. Have I haven't you? been here. No, we've only met once. Yeah, we no. met at um, when we won the Spirit of the Scene Award. I knew it was a awards thing. I couldn't, I couldn't remember what it was, but I know you were about to sign with someone the next day. Yeah. And I had a few drinks, so I thought I'll chance my arm. Yeah. And here we are. <laughs> so I think, yeah. <laughs> Two years later. So, good client. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to turn the clock back mm. to Nottingham. Mm. Let's go to Nottingham. It's Morning. early nineties. Yep. Are you wearing some pretty cool sh shell suit, not tracksuit, no, 90s vibe? No, I had vibe. long hair and torn up Converse. And nice. Various punk rock t-shirts or whatever I might have been into at the time. Uh, there's a record shop, Way Ahead Records. Yeah. Um, uh, and a chap called David Brett. Yeah, I'll cut a long story short here. Cause my dad said to me, never get a job lying in bed with long hair. And I was, uh, <laughs> I was studying computing at what was then called Trent Poly University now. Sounds better, doesn't it? And um, I was doing a placement year. I didn't take things particularly seriously because I was going to be a rock star, so it didn't matter. And I was in bed, unemployed, because I lost my job. And a guy walked in and he said, do you want to come and help out for two, two weeks, cash in hand at the record shop? And I thought, I've got nothing else to do. So I went in. And the guy, Dave, after a week, he, 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 you know, I worked hard because yeah. that's what I do. And he came downstairs with some notes and he said, here's, here's the money, it's a bit more for you for working so hard. Yeah. And, I thought, and a little thing went off in my head and I thought, well, he's a decent guy. It's all right here looking around. Everyone's cool. Um, so I stayed. And because I was doing computing, to cut a long, long story very short, you know, Dave was into computers and he sort of, I mean, I'm cutting a long story very short. After a while, he just thought, you know, why don't you have a go at writing us some software so we can be more efficient? 
you know, rather. And was that was that for selling records at that point? Were you uh, selling tickets to people at that? It point? was. It was tickets. I tell you, you know, we're going to talk about. You know, we got an hour here, so we're going to stick thirty years into an hour, really, with your <laughs> probing questions. But I darted around because basically Dave was a fantastic guy. He is a fantastic guy. He gave me free reign, really, and it's, it was strange because I'd sort of after a while I'd had enough, and I, I thought, you know, maybe I should go get what I thought was a proper job. And he said, "Don't go." He said, "I have six months. Learn what you can about software development and write us something that helps." So first off, I started with ticketing, then I messed out with EPOS systems for record shops and stuff like that. Um, but after, yeah, sorry. And I know I was going to say at that time, I guess when people wanted to go to a show, they mm. would line up outside they used to, we the used venue or would they line a up a bit of both up, yeah? bit of both when, when, we, when, when, when we started well they were selling tickets when I started but it was over the counter and it was 50p you know £5 ticket 50p yeah. cash and so if, you, if they were local gigs Leicester you know Leicester to Montford Hall or, or you know, Rock City or whatever it might have been yeah. and a lot of local things in Narrowboat or whatever it might have been in Knots at the time and so people you know customers used to chance their arm stand outside the record shop or select a disc which is a fantastic record shop in nottingham at the time as well or rock city and we start books of tickets there's no interconnectivity there's no systems yeah. it's a book of tickets and you sold out <laughs> and, you, and then some guy would run down and give you some more um so that was interesting and then computers came along and it was a little bit more efficient but yeah it was uh, it was very much cash and then credit cards came in and after when you started taking credit cards you realized that if you actually put a phone number on an ad people would phone it the phone would ring you pick it up you write the order on an envelope you rattle the card number into the card charging machine which is called a pdq machine yeah and then you put that envelope over there and then someone would put the tickets in it and lick a stamp and off it would go yeah uh, and that's where that started wow yeah good fun yeah i bet it sounds it so so you start selling uh, tickets to local shows. Mm -hmm. um, fast forward to like 1996, uh, yeah. Oasis play <laughs> Nebworth. Yeah. And you shift a quarter of a million tickets inside a day and yeah. you take 60,000 fans to a show in a fleet of 1,200 coaches. Yeah, that was, that so, was all, all, most of that was true. I was going to say, <laughs> it, it, did you just have to lick a lot of stamps on that? Uh, I think, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what the limit, limit, limitations <laughs> are of whatever, but you know, <laughs> When we got that... How did that, yeah. How, how did, did that, that come, come about? about? Well, look, yeah. I, I, look we, I think between 91 and sort of 95, we developed the business and started focusing more on tickets. And the software became more and more yeah. efficient. And we started to extend ourselves past the local area. And Oasis, or the promoters behind Oasis, or whatever, the management, ignition management, uh, were very much about the band. And we were very much about servicing the promoter and the band. It wasn't about us. And it's still not about us, mm. you know. And they wanted a free phone phone number that had to be answered Oasis Hotline and all the rest of it. And there was another yes. ticketing company. Let's say they're American. Let's pretend they were called Ticketmaster. <laughs> and they didn't have the same, I won't say ethics is the right word, but the same standpoint as us. So we got the majority of the tickets. And yeah, what, what number did you say? 250,000 tickets in a day? Yeah, well, yeah, a quarter of a million tickets uh, inside a day. A day, give, it, give or take a month, you know. Um, the, story, yeah, the headline was that. But I, mean, I, I don't, you know, I don't mind telling you the truth now because this is a long time ago. This is 25 years ago. And we had some computers. Of course we did. But the computer's power back in the mid 90s was, was relatively slow. So we had backup of bits of paper and all the rest of it. So Yeah, I mean, but we coloured bits of paper. I just phones going. And you oh, no. Just it was, like oh, it, oh, crikey. You wouldn't believe. I mean, it was insane. We crashed. We, it used to crash the local phone exchanges. BT used to hate us. Uh, Diamond Amazing. Cable at the time used to hate us, and you know the cable provider at the time. We had to phone up every time we had it on sale. We had to phone up and say, "Look, this is going to happen." And they used to do something called call gapping, which they used to push the demand back through the exchanges all the way through the country. Yeah. So you could be calling from, say, Guildford. You'd get as far as the Guildford exchange, and the Guildford exchange would say, "No, I'm not letting this call go any further." And you yeah. get an ex exchange uh, a, a gauge tone. Um, and so, yeah. I, went to that, I went to that show. I went to. I went to. Show. I had to. I had no choice. Yeah, exactly. Oh. I took my little. I took my little brother to that show. You didn't go on our buses, did you? I didn't. No, I didn't. I Good. drove. I drove my Ford Fiesta up there. She might not have got home. <laughs> oh but, God! What <laughs> but I think, I think it was forty thousand on the Saturday and twenty thousand on the Sunday. And wow. now the funny story here. Cause we look. We were. I'm making jokes, right? There's nothing funny about it at the time, and we, we you know, we took everything seriously. Of course. But the forty thousand coaches on the Saturday, we they all had their unique numbers, right? Yeah. They come into the the park at Nebworth, and we park them up. You know, we got the high vis vests and the sort of light saber type things and all this rubbish you see at airports. And we park them up and we we create a massive map. Coach forty seven Bradford, Coach twenty one Southampton. Blah blah blah. Yeah. 
But the, the coach drivers thought, sod this, I want to get out of here early. They start moving, don't they? <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, of course, no. we're all there, have a few beers, watch a band, and think, right, this is easy. We'll go back, a few port cabins, yeah. some flood lighting, and some PA systems, and all the rest. We'll get them home, don't worry about it. We go back and we look at our map and think, doesn't look like this anymore. <laughs> oh, man, you never see anything like it. Uh, you know, the, 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 yeah, of course, we get back before the band finishes, and there was like, a, like an avenue, a tree line avenue, if memory serves me right here. Yeah. Lights go up, click, 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 click. And you see this like a zombie film, right? They're coming towards you. Of course, they've all had a few. Yeah. And they come, and yeah. they like they look for the bus, and they're all singing. And they think, no bus. Where's the bus? <laughs> yeah. From? And oh then of course gosh. they come to the portal cabin. Honestly, it was was like yeah. you know, day of the dead. Yeah. Dawn of the dead, whatever. And how did <laughs> you get out of that then? How what, uh, did you hard get more work, uh, There was. <laughs> Yeah, you know, customers are resourceful. Clients, you know, they, a lot of people found their way back. And of yeah. course, we were blocking the exit anyway. We weren't going to let coaches go with five people on when they should have had 50. Yeah. So, of course, we coordinate ourselves. But there were a few cases, well, I say a few, let's say a few hundred or maybe if not a few thousand. They say, right, and we say, where do you want to go? And they say, Bradford. And we go, well, that's Manchester. Do you want to get on that? And we go, all right. <laughs> yeah. So, look, it, <laughs> it was horrendous. So, we have situations like, uh, I was, uh, funny enough, I was talking to the, the, my colleague who runs a business called Gigantic. Mark, mm -hmm. Mark Gasson, a very good friend of mine. We went for a walk down by the river in Nottingham. She lives in Nottingham as well. Yeah. And we were laughing about this the other, night, the other, the other, the other last Friday. And uh, he says, "You remember me in our hotel room, and the bus was, and the phone was going at three in the morning, and it was like Glasgow Council and the police saying all these buses you blocked up Glasgow city centre. All these Gla all these Oasis fans wanted to, <laughs> wanted to get the buses we blocked up the city centre. Oh, honestly, it was wow. a, it was like you know we wouldn't do anything like that again now. Yeah. Um." But we did, a, we did Glastonbury in 2008, I think. We took 20,000 people or whatever, and that was interesting. Yeah. Um, but look, we're a resourceful and uh, a manageable business, and if a client challenges us to do something, we'll have a go. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> um, your head offices are in Nottingham. Yeah. So why, stay, why did you guys stay in Nottingham? Is it because you, that's where you wanted to be? Did you feel, a lot of people, I think, with businesses think that you have to be uh, in in you know um, london or you know, um, you know so was it was it yeah. because the record shop was there and that's where you it's where your we roots started were? it's where we start look there's an economic reason to be in nottingham there's, there's, an, look, there's a there's a few reasons yeah of course going to london or wherever might have made some sense but economically i don't think i look back and i think i used to use this as 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 sort of sales pitch at the time look you know, Nottingham's a small city. There's little competitive employment. If we'd gone to London with some of the great people we have in the business at the time and, and, mm. and now, we could have lost them to competitors. Nottingham's a relatively cheap city to live in. It's a university town. So we had two universities, the Poly and the Uni, or the two unis as they are now. And so we could attract decent, and let's say skinned talent from those institutions to work with us on a part-time basis and then depending on their aptitude or their willingness to stay or, or whatever could you know could could career them through the business so i think it became it was an accident you know it was dave's hometown um but the more the longer we were there the more it made sense office space was cheap talent was cheap i talent i mean when i say talent i mean staff um, and, the, and you know, what we'd find is people sort of grew up in Nottingham or became attached to Nottingham and never left the business because there was nowhere else in Nottingham really to go. Yeah. And that's not we were holding them captive. It wasn't any Stockholm syndrome type thing. But, you know, it was, it, was, it was something we sort of cultivated over time and it made sense. And it was very easy to defend that type of question. And economically, we could, we could run a business slightly cheaper than the other guys. And therefore, when deals came down to pounds and pence... Yeah, we had the equation in our favour to, to 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 leverage those 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 uh, those conditions to our and I, benefit. And I think, actually, if anything, now you you can have a business and be anywhere in the world. You can't do it. We know? found we yeah. found over the last. And I do think that when I open the curtains in the morning, I think it's drizzling again. Yeah, yeah, Lisbon yeah, sounds nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> let's let's but all no, move to Portugal. No, you know, no, we'll stay. You know, we'll stay there. I mean, we have some fantastic people, and that's where we are, and that's where we'll stay. But yeah, it, it sometimes seems a little bit bizarre when. I'm at home outside Nottingham and the guy from LA phones up for a chat. You know, it's like, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. so we're, you're saying the guy from LA. So we're talking about uh, something that started out selling tickets for shows local to Nottingham. You now have offices in LA. Where else? Let me, let me go. Let's go, let's go, let's go, from, go from, uh, west, yeah. let's go from west to east. Let's say uh, Los Angeles. Yep. The Nashville. Mm -hmm. a little, little thing, you know. Uh, then I think we land in... We land in Nottingham, really, don't we? Then we go to London. Yeah. And then we can go, let's go north to Amsterdam, then Groningen. Yeah. We do some stuff in Copenhagen with Universal Music. It's not really an office, but we've got activity there. Then we can drop down to, wee, let's go to Paris. It's a mm -hmm. good place to be. 
then Marseille, yeah. which is our, where the French business started. Then we can go Lisbon, and we did have an office in Madrid, but it was all sort of working from home in, in, um, in Spain at the moment. Mm-hmm. And Berlin, a place in Berlin. There's some great places. Yeah, I think, that's, I think I've ticked all the boxes. Oh, hang on, no, we have Zurich as well. We okay. acquired a business in Switzerland, so we have Zurich. So, yeah. Amazing. So I, don't, I, can't, I think I always say 10. I don't know if that was 10, yeah. but I think that's about right, yeah. So what does your day-to-day look like? So, I mean, I guess from... What, Pre-COVID or in COVID? I suppose pre-COVID, <laughs> you pre- know, co- like you said, you went from, from uh, you know, putting tickets in envelopes, yeah, stick yeah, them yeah. off, to then developing software, to then, you biz, know... Biz dev, man, managing director. You know, yeah, know, so I, was, I was a lucky person, really. I don't think in a more professional environment someone like me would have found this position. Let's be, let's be realistic here. But... And as I said before this interview, it was about, made, you know, we, we all make a lot of mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes. But we were an entrepreneurial business and we mm. made money and we kind of got away with things and all the rest of it. I'm very proud of what we've done. But to your point about what the, biz, what, what the business is about today, it's not, it's not about me, obviously. I'm here sat representing the business and giving you some personal anecdotes and whatnot. But it's more about, it's about team development now is, is, is really the thing I'm, I'm interested in. And this is, again, about learning from my mistakes or telling my kid to learn from my mistakes. Don't make your own. <laughs> it was delegation yeah. was a huge problem when I was, when I was younger. Yeah. Uh, stress was a huge problem. Um, trusting people was a huge problem. Yeah. And overextending or overpromising was a huge problem. Yeah. You know, all those Gosh. things. I think the framework around us and the supportive shareholders we've had as a business is, you know, I think they've seen more good of me than bad, and I think I've made more good decisions than bad ones. But I think to that point, looking back and not trying to repeat those mistakes, is more about, to me, it's about developing the staff and trusting the staff. Mm. And certainly, as we, if we go from pre-COVID to you know, where we are today, and you know, touch some wood. That yeah, is, there you go, that desk. Wood, we get past this, there's some fantastic talent or, or characters in the business that sort of popped up above the parapet that I may not have spotted or we may not have spotted in a more normal day-to-day come in the office sit in your Mm -hmm. box do your job go home tick boxes all that type of you know this was a as it is for everyone it's a surrender situation and everyone has to muck in but you know some people may be mucking in a slightly different way or more energetic way or more imaginative Mm -hmm. way to solving a problem so for me it's this has been a real eye-opener and i was saying to a colleague a finance director cfo lady called leanne who's been with the business 25 years like this week or something daft that you know i think personally i've become better at managing people yeah um because we've i've had no choice and i think i wish i'd learned this like 30 years ago what i've learned you know is to trust people because they're not all idiots and if you'd have asked me 30 years ago i'd have been all idiots you know (laughs) so i think oh hang on oh someone's going to complain hello the boiler room (laughs) uh yes uh hang on just a second hang on um yeah yeah i can definitely ask him oh oh dear okay uh the question is um oh hang on a minute yeah, no, yeah. Oh, I have a big drink for us. Okay, yep. Ben from Godalming wants to know. Okay. Uh, do you have any rock and roll moments from meeting bands backstage? Uh, no. That's <laughs> a really fast answer. There, I've, I've, I've met a few Thanks, people, but nothing rock and roll. I think, um, look, we're a business that we don't... Look, I think it would be fairly easy if we were that sort of outgoing set of people to force a way into a situation to have fun. But that's not our job. We're here to do a professional job. Yeah, we love what we do. You know, we're fans generally of what it is we sell. And, you know, we discussed before this thing, you know, our portfolio of, 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 of clients is diversified away from music mm-hmm. or been extended from music. Music's yeah. very much part, a big part of the business. But no, sa- sadly not. I don't have any rock and roll stories. <laughs> I wish I did, but I don't. They probably so are sorry, Ben. Yeah. I've got nothing interesting to tell you at all. So they um, are. I wanted to touch on um, when I was doing a bit of research um, <laughs> That C really uh, were sort of pioneers looking at you weren't you weren't afraid to, at the changing sort of landscape of how people were purchasing gig tickets. Not not, not using never technology. Been afraid of anything really like yeah. that because it was always like we we're always happy to be still going because we always felt like the little guys. But I yeah. think in 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 our um, industry, you know, I remember when when uh, music st- you know went 
streaming. Yeah, yeah. You know, people like Spotify. No, it's never going to, you know, people are never going to stream yeah. music and pay a subscription fee. That's mad. That won't mm, happen. Mm, mm, mm. Um, and so I guess my question to you is kind of, one, how do you uh, diversify, constantly yeah, yeah. diversify? And now looking at how live streaming, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're looking at another model altogether, aren't we? Now we're saying, well, actually, tickets, live streaming, do you think C will have to diversify kind of again? Do you feel... That We've you, always you'll do that or do you um, think other companies are, are, are there and prepared to do it and you don't need to any, you oh know, no no that? no 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 we never think we don't need to do anything I yeah. think we're always I was saying this to my chairman actually the other day a guy called Simon in Paris great guy and I said I, I think we, you know I personally and I think the business has in its head always been looking over its shoulder or looking at the competition mm. you know I think sometimes sometimes I, I, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm I'm baffled by some of the numbers the business behind the business. I think, wow, really? We did that? Um, but we don't take it for granted. So, yeah, we very, have a very keen eye on what's going on in the marketplace from a competitive angle, but also from a technological angle. I think, you know, as I said before, I studied computing. So I got a rough idea how all that sort of stuff clicks together. I don't really fully understand all of it today, of course not, but I know enough. And I remember when the internet came along, and first off, it was a bit of a novelty. And I remember a particular promoter, he'd, had a, he'd done a deal with a guy who'd created a website. And he's basically, he's like, this is how it will get a, this is how it works. Someone will order a ticket off this website and you get an email and then you type it into your computer. And I'm like, that stuff sounds like a load of crap to me. <laughs> and then we started looking and thought, well, there's something here. <laughs> this is a funny story, this is. And then uh, we started looking into the internet and what it meant. And we started to build some rudimentary extension to our ticketing platform so you could sell online. And it used, and we next stuff. this is true. Everything I'm saying today, is true. <laughs> just for emphasis, is good. This is just, I'm just, this Don't is the worry. first time I've remembered this for a very long time, right? And I used to have an office on the top floor of this in the building in Nottingham. And on the, on the on a desk on the corner by the window was the computer, and that was the internet computer. And every time we sold a ticket through this, it went ping, right? <laughs> then we did a spy <laughs> skills, right? And when was that? I can't remember. What was it 90, 98, 97? I don't know, 98. No, it's definitely 98, 98. And it, was, and it was a Saturday morning something came in and beep, 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 beep. oh what a mess and then we realised <laughs> there's something in this internet thing so we put a bit of money behind it and but I think and this, I think this does play to your point a little bit we had to ask ourselves what we wanted to be and I think it started the dot com boom and it was all about if you, had, if you put dot com after your name you were worth a fortune right yeah but our business, if you and go back to that Oasis point I made about the Oasis telephone number being answered as the Oasis hotline, we yeah. thought, well, hang on a minute. If you build websites for clients, so make it easy for a client to launch a website, yeah. right? Don't say just put our website on your ad. Because we're up against Ticketmaster. We didn't have the brand, right? Yeah. So I remember going to a few clients and say, look, we'll build you your website. They're like, what do you mean? Well, let's build your website. I'll give you a website. You go get the domain name and blah, blah, blah. And if you take um, a site like gigsandtours.com, mm -hmm. Big site, huge. Um, owned by SGM Concerts. Huge. Yeah. That was how that came about. Yeah. And we still run that to that day. So I think our, right then, it was a, it was a you know, perfect intersection between technology and, and branding and customer demand. And I think, you know, when I look at the, the landscape now, that every, it, every, you know, we were doing white labels before they called white labels. I remember saying, someone saying to me something about white label. What do you mean? I thought you meant 12 inch thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. Dance what, yeah. I thought, what are you talking about white label? Um, so I think we got it right on that day. Whether I answered your question or not, I don't know. But I think on that, you know, that particular point in time, we, it was a perfect junction. It's like, which way are we going to go? Are we going to be a dot-com brand and try and be big and make shitloads of money by bullshitting? Or are we going to service the, the, the clients or the customers or whatever? And we've always held that ethic that, and I said it you know, to, to a prospect today, which we, which, we, which we signed. It's not about us. It's not, not about us at all. It's about you, the producer, the investor, the artist, whatever, the venue, and it's about your customers. We are just the conduit, and we have to make sure your customer gets the best experience from us because we are an extension of your organization. So you own the data and blah, blah, blah. So we really put a lot of stuff on the table um, towards the end of the 90s that ordinarily I think our competitors might not have done. Mm. Uh, but it stood us in good stead. And I think those were the foundations of the business as they, as they are today, along with the, you know, the long-serving team that we still have in the business. So I think, I think we've retained that. That, that ethic, if, that, if that's the right word. There's certainly the attitude still there, you know. Well, actually, um, looking, talking about late, uh, late 90s as well, I wanted to pick up that um, you uh, way ahead 
um, were the sole agents for the Diana Museum. Yeah. And we had a little chat we, before we yeah, before I'd we went live about, about I'm, this. I'm, 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 I'm sort of surprised you dug that up, but yeah, you did. I so mean, here we go. Digging yeah. up and Diana doesn't sound No, right, it doesn't but, you know. <laughs> not great. Two, two things <laughs> are put together. But, <laughs> but anyway. f- firstly, um, uh, what a challenge that, that must have been. I can imagine it would... Everyone was probably interested. Lots of people wanting to purchase tickets. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. There's there's an there's an interview where you um, discuss that many callers were emotional, believing mm. that they were actually calling Althrop and wanting to leave messages yeah, yeah. of condolence. Um, and within, I think it says within four days, 140,000 tickets have been sold out yeah, of 152. That was, that was crazy. So t- yeah. Tell me about sort of firstly how. how how that came about and then secondly how, how it came you, about yeah, I, mean, I have to put jokes it. aside so of course we're talking about something that's you know emotional to, to, to people but when it came about a chappy i won't use his name just in case i don't think i'm giving anything away but a guy came up as a representative from from diana's family estate or Orthorpe in northamptonshire and he said i'm so and so and i'm you know i've heard you can help us with so and so and blah blah it's like yeah and again it was before the internet and it was very much a custom mm. job we want you to produce an invitation or a letter yeah. You, you take the book in and then you mail merge it and you send a letter with a family seal on and all this type of stuff. It's very, very personalised, you know. But at the time, it was, as I said, it was pre-internet and this was a global thing. Mm. So 24 hours a day, you knew what time zone you were in by who was calling. So, the, yeah. you know, you'd get, you know, it would go around the world. So you'd be up 24 hours a day and the Japanese would be on the phone at like two in the morning. And we were reliant on, because we never, we did, had no idea what this was going to do. And it was, he was turning the news on in the morning and be a, a, a reporter outside Althorpe in Northampton saying, inside this building is 100 operators and all the rest of it. I'm not watching the TV thinking, no, there's about 30 <laughs> people in this office in Nottingham. But anyway, yeah. we'll put that to one side. But no, it was, it was a real challenge. Right now, we'd sell something like that in an hour, if that. Yeah. But it took all wow. week. And... And what was it like having people call up thinking that they were actually speaking to... It was to, hard work. I mean, how did you manage... Yeah, how did you well, manage we, the, the, that? Well, we had a representative from the estate embedded with us mm. for duration. Celia something. She's a nice lady. And so, it, look, it was, a, it was a high profile thing. Yeah. Were we the right yeah. business at the time? I don't know. Did we do a good job? I think we did. We did it for a few years before it sort of, you know, ultimately yeah. this thing diminish. Um, did we care? Yes, we did. Um, was it good for our business? I think it was. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was one of the big diversification things that landed in our lap. It wasn't, wasn't strategy mm. at all. But it did open the doors to other things coming f- outside of music. So the business started to change from that point. But it was, it was, it was tough. I mean, it really was tough. Yeah, you know, you're there 24 imagine. hours a day sleeping on the floor thinking, this is not going to start. And, and of course, you had other clients. Let me, it's, yeah. uh, this is an important point. Clients phoning up saying, none of our customers can get through. If you don't sort this out, you don't have any business. And you have to take that stuff seriously. And okay, yeah. we might be making, we were making hand over fist. I've always said that, but it wasn't true. It was a very cheap deal. Um, and we're thinking, we can clear this. You can't, the whole of the world is phoning your office in Nottingham. Yeah. You can't make them go away. <laughs> There's nothing you can do. You just have to weather the storm. But that's what we did. Um, but yeah, it was an uh, interesting time. But uh, and I wanted to pick up on you said uh, you said about diversifying, yeah. um, diversifying in the sense of not just selling uh, tickets to yeah. musical, you know, music concerts and gigs. Um, was there a point for you that you actually thought, right, we need to, you know, we need to yeah, look ni- for different clients? Yeah, nineteen ninety nine. So, I know exactly when it was because uh, you had a company called SFX came in, who became Clear Channel. Yep. Merge equipment and then became Live Nation as we know it today. And they bought overnight sort of 25 or 30% of our client list essentially by volume. Wow. It was like, now what are we going to do? Wow. And that point is just critical time because you think, right, this yeah. is not good. This is not good. This is not good. And we started looking at consumer exhibitions. And the first one we signed, funny enough, is the Ideal Home Show, which at the time was almost 100 years old. So that was a household name. Yeah. And, you know, again, we, I think we had the right story, the right pricing. And all the rest of it. And then from that, spun off a load of other activity of that type. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, you know, you, I'd like to be, give you a professional view on strategy and all the rest of it and five-year and ten-year plans. But I won't lie to you. I haven't yeah. got a five-minute plan some of, the, <laughs> some of the times. No, it's a slightly unprofessional thing for me <laughs> to say. But no, I think sometimes we're a bus- where a business has to react to the conditions of the market. Yeah. Someone knocks on the doors and says, I've got this. Do you want to do it? You say yes or you say no. You say yeah. no and that could be it. You say yeah. We're a business that tries to say yeah. 
But as I said earlier, we're not a business that says yes and worries about how we're going to do it. We're a business that says yes in confidence and total uh, uh, conviction that we can provide that service to that customer and that client. Oh. It's loud, it? Every time it yeah, me too. Hello? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. I can definitely ask him. Yep. Okay. So we have uh, Emily from London who wants to know what made you stay with Sea Tickets huh. for. They put 22 years, is that correct? 30. 30 years. It was way ahead before. Yeah. So what are we now? 2021, aren't we? Thanks for the question. 99. Uh, I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> glutton, glutton for punishment. No, no, I think, uh, I think, it's a, obviously that's a personal question. Yeah. Um, I think it's a challenge, really. And, and working with, with friends mm. and in an industry that I enjoy. And look, there's been times, I won't lie, that I thought, forget this. I think 2000 and three-ish I thought I don't want to do this anymore and 2012 <laughs> 13 I thought I've had enough you get those crises really yeah and, that, you know. and it still does challenge you then you still find it a challenge yeah, I get it. yeah absolutely and some yeah. days you wake up and I think but that's you know it's not often uh, and the older you get the more experienced you get the more resilient you get uh, but there are times you think is that it and you think well if it's it it's pretty good yeah. Really. And certainly in, 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 in these times. Yeah. You know, very, very, very happy to have the shareholders we've got in, 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 in Vivendi. They've been very supportive of the business. So I think it's really, it's, you know, when I have that, yeah, it's, it's a good question. What made me stay? I think the challenge, but also the times I thought that's probably enough for me. It's probably the thinking, stepping back and realizing the, the network of friends in, 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 in clients or colleagues or shareholders or whatever. And, a little bit of, you know, that's what I do. What else am I going to do? I don't know. No idea. I often think that myself. I think, <laughs> am I actually unemployable now? Because I've been uh, working for myself for 15 years. I've run my own, my own company. You kind well, of think... I doubt you're unemployable. You've, you've I mean, probably got yeah. transferable skills, but you well, do I think... I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> I think they're very much damaged. No, I, 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 I think, you know, when you get in your groove, you do what you do and yeah. you stick to it. And I look at some of our clients... And I, won't, I won't mention names, but they stick to their guns, and I, they sometimes are an inspiration to me. Yeah. Because I think, right, you're you you you're, you're doing, and I, you know, I'd like to, you know, yeah. I, I do get inspiration from certain quarters, and there's a handful of people I look at in life, uh, and Dave's a good example, the original founder. I don't want to say too much about him because it's not it's not right for me to, you know, characterise him in any way. But he's he was an inspiration. There's been a few other people in my life that you know, my ch current chairman has helped me a lot. Um, you know, certainly in 2012 or th whatever it was he said don't go it'll be get better and it yeah. certainly got better yeah. you know and there's other people I don't want to name check too many people because it'd be unfair because I'll probably miss people out um, but I think it's the support of people that just make you step back and think nah it's not it's not my crisis here mm. this is there is no crisis this is this is good this is good so stick to it you know so I want to um, uh, touch upon um, sort of secondary ticketing mm, and so and how I guess back in the day where you were putting tickets in envelopes and ticket touts and yeah, yeah. you know oh, yeah. uh, and that, old that, school yeah yeah that that going from something like that to really what the challenges that you face now as a ticketing uh, company yeah, yeah. so that's you know, a, that's a good question and yeah the Oasis um, conversation was a very interesting one earlier because. Because that does remind me of those days where you would do, say, take people on coaches to an event and mm. the touts knew how that worked. They knew coach drive would more than likely have a couple of tickets for customers didn't get them. Yeah. So it was a race between us and the touts to get to the coach driver with some official ID to say, we are from Wayhead or C tickets. If you've got any spare tickets, give them to us and we'll sort the customer out. So touts have got kind of clever. So touts, you know, I think touts to a degree serve some, some, some utility in certain sections. Not to us. You know, but they were a fabric of, they were part of the fabric. And, you know, if you were a customer and you wanted to go to gig, rock up and the guy might sell you a ticket or he might not. When it went industrial and the mm. terminology changed, went from touting or scalping, whatever you want to call it, suddenly it became secondary. Yeah. Legi almost legitimizing it. Yeah. I'm not a fan of it at all. Mm -hmm. as, as Adam, that you know, we were on a call earlier. Yeah. You know, we'd, we'd say, you know, we've, we've never been part of that. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to call out competitors that may or may not have engaged in this thing. But it was never something we wanted to do. And, you know, when we've got people like Glastonbury, you know, on the books, 
it's, it just doesn't make business sense. It makes no sense from a cons consumer perspective. And then, obviously, all this stuff was going on, and we launched something called Fan to Fan. I mean, I, I have to yeah. give give credit to Twicket for coming out with this ethical resale platform. We thought, well, hang on, we can do this as well. Mm. Um, so no, I've never never been a fan of, of of that. The challenge at the moment, I think, is largely neutralised because artists, promoters, and everything else are coming up with their own mechanics and yep. digital ticketing and non transferable lists. And the glass free example is a great one. The photo ticket you can't get around that one. You sell it to your twin brother or sister, and that's about it. Yeah. Um, so we look, we do our best, but it, again, though, this is a very important point. It's not our place. We have a view, and we have utilities and systems and all the rest of it to block it if the client wants us to do, but we're not, we're not policemen. Are you it's involved in that process? Say for something like Glastonbury, do you work with them to say, right, how do we, mm. how do you know, how do we work on this, uh, you know, purchasing a, a ticket for Glastonbury? Like you said, I think you have to we upload. We're very consultative with them. Yeah. yeah you so have they to upload exactly a photo and then do you say, well, actually, no, well, if you did this, they, someone might do that or that, yeah, you know, you kind of constantly oh, no, we, round table. Oh, oh, no, absolutely. No, they are, and look, you know, I won't say too much about them either because they know themselves yeah. better than I do, but they but, are a, a business or family business that's built a phenomenal cultural uh, institution, if you can call it that. Mm. And they know exactly what they want and how it, how it should be done. Yeah. And it's, we either do it or we don't do it. Yeah. Uh, and of course, yeah, we have got conversations, are very open conversations. And it's, look, you know, we could fly around the world with Glassbury and we can open doors with, yeah. that, with, that, with, that, with that client. And we're very, very proud to have them on the books. But no, again, it's, it points to our resilience or adaptiveness or imagination. Um, to how we deal with with clients and their customers, so they hated ticketing, and they had, like they had uh, sorry uh, scalping or touting or whatever you want to call yep. it, and they you know they had licensing problems and all the rest of it. They just need that. And the glass we did, you know how hot these things are. They go sell out in twenty five minutes. Yeah, they say those tickets will go for thousands of pounds. Yeah, they would. Yeah, right, they would. So it was absolutely absolutely essential that something was done about it. And they came up with this. Well, they had this technological solution, which we argued wouldn't work in the mud. We came up with a very simple thing to replicate it with, with you know, with, with with those guys, and it's worked really, really well. It doesn't work for everything because mm. it's a, you know, as you said, you put, I think it was you know, the tone there was like you register a photo and you do this and you do that. It's a bit of work. Yeah, but yeah, but I people think are prepared to do it, aren't they? Because they want they want well, to go they're, they're, attend the event. Well, they're prepared to do it because it's the only way they can get tickets. But it's fair. Mm. Right, there's not like a free for all, and then someone pays what 250 quid or whatever it might be. They these days, and five seconds later, it's up on some secondary or touting site for two and a half grand. And is that why, like, like you said, Fan to Fan was launched in 2017 to yeah, enable the, people to resell tickets, but a uh, face it was, it was it was our position. Yeah, it was it was. Look, we never made any money out of it. We won't make any money out of it. But at the time, you know, people are trying to justify all this stuff. Yeah. Um, and there was, I think it was a fanfare alliance and all sorts of stuff. We thought, look, we have to anchor ourselves to some point here. And okay, we'll always do what the client wants. That overrides everything. But we thought we need to make a, 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 put ourselves in a position here. Where are we going to be? We were on that side. So we put, put this thing together. And okay, if you've got a ticket and you know you can sell it for two or three times, yeah, you can go and sell it. Right? You can do what you want. Or if you are like-minded, you, you want to put it back just to get a, a, a refund or resell it, then you could use our exchange platform you know that's our position what a customer does and i'll be i'll say this personally mm. if a customer buys a ticket and sells it makes some money well so be it if that's what they want to do and there's a willing seller willing seller willing buyer that's commerce what else yeah. can you you know you can't otherwise where does that end i wanted to pick up on the point um you said about resilience yeah and as a um the leader of a company, I guess, uh, uh, and also as a as a company, have there been times where you you've talked about personally having to dig deep? But as a company, have, have you had to weather some storms of oh, yeah. of, of changing, uh, you know, been changing times, you tides? Think. Where yeah, I mean, I'm I'm is there anything that that sticks out in your mind? Like I don't know, like you said, when tickets went from physical to online or I don't from, think we've you know, ever, yeah, or when think, Live Nation came in and swooped up half of your clients and you decided to I don't think there's do been other, a collective other. a collective um, what's the word insecurity I yeah. don't think that's happened there have been crossroads and we've been through a number of shareholders and all the rest of it yeah you know and it, it can be different opinions that come in yeah and you might think I don't like this or we don't like it and it's a case of and it's also client demands or whatever and you have to be sensitive and diplomatic and sometimes you have to let things go 
Uh, and I think that's part of being resilient. I mean, the long-term thing is to keep the business going, serve our customers and the clients and pay people's wages and all the rest of it. That's, that's business. Mm. Um, I cannot think of a collective crisis where we've thought we're dead or in trouble. But there are times when you think, right, this is going to cost a ton of money. And there were times, certainly at the advent of the internet, and maybe we're a bit slow in places. We didn't sometimes have the financial fire, firepower to compete with, say, Ticketmaster at the time, you know, sometimes our systems would creak. And yeah. you'd, you'd get it in the neck and you'd be five past nine and promote would phone up and they wouldn't be happy. Mm. And they'd be told, you'd sort this out, otherwise you're gone. You sort it out or you're gone. So there are those crises where you think, right, we've got to do something here. But let's take it all to bits and put everything back together and get it right. Now, I know we are, we're exactly, we have been for a long time. We've been exactly where we want to be. And I don't think we're missing a beat anywhere. But, you know, maybe a client will phone in a minute and give me some, <laughs> <laughs> and tell me I'm wrong there. Yeah, it's, uh, but, it's a <laughs> I hope not. I do home <laughs> Yeah, no, I, th um, I think, you know, I don't think there's ever been a time we thought we were out of the game. Because um, I think we've, you know, we've, but again, it goes to the people in the business. They've been absolutely fantastic. And sometimes they really, really, really do work hard to get things done. There's no nine till five in our, in our culture, you know. Um, so another question that's come in um, via uh, online is, yep. um, does selling a particular type of ticket excite you more than other tickets? Ooh. For example, oh, that's a great question. selling Glastonbury ticket over um, uh, Chelsea Julia. Ch Chelsea Julian. Yeah, Julia. Like, yeah, Julia. Okay, I like that. Uh, okay, all right, Chelsea. Is that first name? I think so. Right. Chelsea. Well, well, whatever. It's Chelsea. Whatever, it? Chelsea or Julia. Um, any any Lovely particular name. type Beautiful that name. excite me? That, yeah, that's a really good question because I, I wish I had an answer. That's why it's a good question. <laughs> yeah, I've no idea. I'm going to think about that one. I'm going to ponder that. Yeah, because I guess I mean the breadth of clients that you must have i mean you mentioned ideal home and then obviously yeah. we said glastonbury i mean what what is the have, if you've got something quite um random that you sold tickets for that doesn't fall into maybe I, that, I, that i will category? have an answer i'm, I'm trying <laughs> to think Look, it's, it's easy to point at glastonbury because there's a there's that excitement you get on that sunday morning you know yeah. when they're uncontended and you're looking at the numbers you know one minute it's five thousand then it's 15 then it's 30 and it's just like by the time you finish your cup of coffee yeah. You've sold out and you go back to bed. And that, wow. that's exciting. But, but in the lead up, you know, everyone's like this. Because yeah. you never know. Is there a type of ticket? Yeah. I mean, what kind of events do you sell or have done in the past sold tickets for? Oof. I wouldn't know where to start with that. Look, yeah. we cover everything. Theatre, comedy, sport, music, festivals. Yeah. Exhibitions. I think I said that already. We're getting into the trade registration piece for consumer uh, trade exhibitions you know it's sort of industrial but why not it's something that is close to i think at the moment to answer answer chelsea's question i think the stuff that excites me most is if we sell a ticket for a new segment that we weren't previously selling for yeah. so the moment i mean giving away trade secrets i'm not i mean we're interested we like i like the ex exhibition space yeah i think it's a very very interesting space so there's a lot of data collection a lot of data management a lot of analysis that can be done and I think we can add, as a business, a lot of value to that segment. And we've done very, very well over the last few years of signing a lot of this stuff up. I think the immersive sector is interesting. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm, coming, I'm saying this because it's sort of topical. We signed some good clients over the last couple of weeks, really, uh, in segments that a few years ago we may not have been in. So yeah. I think, I think to, to the question, it's about selling something new. But there again, I still get a kick out of, you know, we still get a kick out of, you know, selling stuff we've, you know, for, for, for you know, a client we've had for 20 odd years or whatever. Yeah. You know, and I like that, you know, because I do get, I think we all do, we get a thing out of, you, know, you think, wow, I remember doing that deal way back when. And time flies. And that's, mm -hmm. that's the thing. That's yeah. that, and that, to, to the previous question about why, if it's a personal question, why I'm still there, that's it as well. It's a history thing. And think, wow, I mem you know, we remember doing this and signing that client and they're still with us today. And that's, 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 that's the best bit of this job, I think. And what have you had clients that have been with you the full time that you've been? Pretty been much, yeah. There? Wow. Yeah, I'd like to say SJM. Yeah. I'd like to name check Simon Run, I think. Yeah. Because he was, yeah, it was one point, I don't want to, I will tell a story because it didn't matter so long ago. But he was, but we, this is when we were selling tickets pretty much in the, you know, out of, above the record shop. And one day he said, I'm not going to send you any more tickets. You're not selling them. This is before the internet. Yeah. Put a phone down. I won't go into all the story because that would reveal too much really. But I thought I'm, I'm in trouble here. And I knew it was going to break for us. And I sent him a letter. A letter. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Signed it. 
And I'll, put a seal I'll, on it. Yeah. And he basically, he's, you know, he, I don't, you know, I'm sure he won't phone me in a minute and say he shouldn't have said that. But he said, I can't afford to service you. It's a waste of time. Why am I going to pay someone to send you tickets and then you send them back again? And my proposition, I, I will say it. I said, look, I'll pay the wages for that person to send them to us. And they will yeah. send it back. Because trust me, it will come good. Yeah. And it did come good. And we went on to do the gigs and tours thing. And we still have them as a client now. And I'm very thankful for him. To him, because... I always, I, I always take SJM. If we were a shopping centre, SJM, if you some like, in some ways, are our Harvey Nicks or our John Lewis or whatever, you know? It's, yeah. They've got, they got the good stuff that people walk into the shopping centre for. Yeah. So to have them in our shopping centre is means a lot, um, you know, to the business and me personally in, 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 in some ways. So, look, we don't take any of this for granted. We have to fight every year to new deals and all the rest of it and we cannot let our guard down or drop the ball because we will be dropped and that's the driver and that's another it's, there's, there, there's an answer to, to a question to you, you know, why two questions ago why are you still with the business that challenge yeah so would you um, looking to the future talking about um, adapting and t- you know live streaming especially mm. with uh, everything that's been in the news in the last couple of days with, yeah. uh, with PRS and live streaming yeah. and COVID uh, planning a lot of venues like ours are now live streaming. Um, do, you, do you see that as the future a good of question, where ticketing says, is going? Or do you think that the, the new show is now a hybrid show? And does that also yeah. apply to your other clients? You know, I'm going to give you the, the, the provocative, possibly and contentious answer. I don't believe... I think if streaming was all the things you say, it would have been there before covid i think it's got a part to play of course it has Mm -hmm. um yeah but look look where we are right this is a fantastic venue you've got a bar you've got probably a great crowd comes in here why do we go to live gigs why do we go to live gigs you can't watch it on an ipad you want to go meet your mate for a couple of drinks come in see your mates have some beers get a kebab whatever it's that's what it live music's Mm -hmm. about isn't it it was when you were yep younger you're young anyway (laughs) Certainly was yeah. when I was in me, you know, late teens and, and, and early 20s or even earlier than that. It was about the social thing. Streaming has a place. Of course it does. Will streaming, it'll augment it. But, you know what I mean? If, a, if you're a band and you can come to the UK and do five stadium shows or whatever arenas or a club tour or whatever, you can't do that every night on stream. Yeah. Right, you can't. Yeah, it just doesn't work. You watch one and you're bored. And I, I always worry about the the amount of content already out there. You know, on YouTube. Yeah, it's live, and you, you, but it's not the it's not the same. And that's 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 me speaking, not from a business perspective. That's just me. Would I? So yeah, would you launch? Would you would see? Would you see see launching a your own platform to facilitate? people streaming no, no, and no doing i don't tickets. think i'm giving away any, no, i don't way. think yeah. i'm saying anything i shouldn't yeah. in a professional capacity but yeah. n- no because a lot of there have been a lot of ticketing companies that have now jumped haven't they that have now well, doing launching yeah and, absolutely and I was, no i i, I, was I, I interested I, well we did look at it i tell you that the challenge is and again this goes back to the question about prs and all the rest of it, it was yeah. the, was the the rights piece because you know mm. some, some clients would say how do we do it yeah. We're in a ticketing business, but yeah. they see us as a technology business in some respects. Yeah. I think I've absolutely no idea. Now, you've rigged up all this stuff yourself. You learned how to do it. I saw you on the news this morning. Yes. Do you know what you're talking about? <laughs> I, I have absolutely no idea. And clients will say to us, how do you do it? And then it would always boil down to, what about the rights? I think, I have absolutely no idea. You mm. know, which, which, which of the, you know, the, 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 the broadcast platform, platforms have those, those, those collection mechanisms in place to pay off the, the rights to societies. And a lot of people are using YouTube. And they, okay, it'll look like it's gatekept. But as soon as you're on YouTube, you are on YouTube. You mm. can take that link and you can send it to 100 people. Therefore, eliminating the commercial benefit to the artist. That's how I read it today. I think, I, th- I saw it as a minefield. Yeah. I think we saw it as a minefield. We had a few people in the business take a look at it. Uh, and we decided it probably wasn't for us. We're happy to sell a, a stream ticket. Yeah. We're happy to gatekeep it. But the, 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 you know, the, the broadcast, the stream and the broadcast recording and all that sort of stuff. It's not our forte. And do you think with tickets, because I suppose, yes, it is a digital ticket you sell, so yep. it's the physical ticket yes. has become digital. Yep. W- do you think there's another incarnation to come of that? You know, do you think it will always be that? I mean, people obviously get tickets to their phones now, so you just scan an app. Don't You don't even have an actual True. physical ticket. True. Do you think 
where do you think that could possibly go? Do you think one day we'll just have a, a thumbprint and it will just be I, a, I, look, it'll be loaded onto a chip that's in our arm or well, something? What's, what's, what's the most you know, unique thing we've got about us? We've got fingerprints, we've got faces. Yeah. We've got DNA, we're not going to do that. Yeah. Um, so you could see some sort of face recognition, gatekeep thing. But I think that's intrusive um, a little bit. Um, I think Tiki Master are working on some audio type thing where you'd have, a, you know, your phone, I think, if I remember rightly, yeah. would sort of put out a sub audio, you know, sub, sub, you know, sub uh, human hearing or above human hearing spectrum wow. frequency. And that would be a ticket. And, it, you know, but yeah. I'd read about that a year ago. I think I might be right. I might be wrong on that. I have to look it up. I might have made it up. I don't think I made it up. But I think it was could something like dream. that. Yeah, could it could have been a dream. Yeah. A dream about it. But, but, you know, <laughs> it's, it has, you know, I think it was what? 15 years ago people say mobile 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 and it never really happened but now yeah. covid has sort of accelerated yeah. that trend uh and it does work and you know i think when it was i'm getting technical now when it was sort of barcode readers were lasers of course mobile phone wouldn't work but now it's images it's a, it's a camera mm. and now it works and we use it we do a hell of a lot of digital ticketing and but there's also the challenges of, you know, mobile phones at the you know, front of house and batteries going dead and being families or whatever. And he's got the phone, where's the phone, all this type of stuff. I think ingress is an issue. I think print at home was the bridge between the old promoter or venue printed tickets and, yeah. and mobile. Yeah. Print at home still has, has a place. But, you know, if you're selling a ticket, it has a number of add-ons, you know, it's 15, 20 pieces of paper it's unwieldy. Yeah. I don't think it's a smart answer. We get, you know, you got wristbands, but you need to post them or you collect them, which means there's queuing. You know, it's horses for courses. Um, it all depends on the conditions um, yeah. and what the what the client's trying to achieve, and you know, the, you know how how big is the you know the door to get people in. I mean, there's a lot of factors. Yeah. I think we try and touch all, um, but we are a business. I'll be I'll be totally blunt on this that we'll look at ideas, and if we like them, we'll steal them. Mm -hmm. you know we are like that we have to be everybody is so if we see yeah. a little business doing something we think is interesting we're going to nick the idea yeah. so that sounds a horrible thing to say but that's 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 a, that's the fact of life so but yeah it's it's we try and touch all those all those all those you know instruments um, um, so i'm gonna i uh, just a couple of more questions no, I go think, for it. and it's then fun. we are our, our time we will be right. nearly we're nearly done oh, wait. um yeah i know that's a shame great company see <laughs> um so Second to last question. What yeah. advice would you give to someone who is uh, starting up their own business um, now in this oh, current climate? Okay. I get, um, yeah. You know, you look back um, from your days, like you said, in the record store and working above it, doing the tickets and going from there to uh, taking the company to where it is now. Yeah. I mean, that in itself is, you know, is a, is a huge achievement. And obviously you've mentioned there are times where... Uh, it's been up and down yeah, yeah. personally Indeed. for you yeah, yeah, yeah. and you talked business, about resilience yeah. but um you know is it is it always been that you've you've had that hunger for something and it just hasn't ever been stated yet or you know what what is it what, what's your driver and how would you necessarily distill that into knowledge for someone that maybe has an idea is in, innovative and has got something that they want to do whatever whatever it is um it's, it's, what, it's what a very good going question for 30 but, uh, years in in an industry that i think i think uh, first off yeah. you've got to you've got to enjoy what you do you're, or you've got to be challenged by what you do why do people climb mountains i mean that's insane why would you do that but people do um i think look, i can give you i can give you this the stock answer which is easy you can read it any book i mean in honesty integrity drive all that sort of rhubarb uh and you know i can look back and think there's been times where i've probably not been all the things personally i wanted to be all the business mm. i think the thing is if i did think about this i did anticipate this question it's about not just challenging yourself because that sounds a little bit stock but i think just being open-minded to keep learning and learn yeah. from people doesn't matter if the you know if they're below you in some respects or juniors or employees or outside the business or a guy down a pub or or, or 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 your chairman or the boss or a share or whatever it might be listen yeah. to everyone use what is useful if you don't like it don't use it but keep it in mind because it might be useful and i've made you know there's times certainly as in anybody's life that i've not listened to people and i wish i had when i look back um i think that's probably it but stay open-minded stay light on your toes stay energetic and don't bullshit people i suppose yeah if i'm allowed to swear yes you are all right <laughs> i think that's probably yeah that's that's probably it i don't know if it's a recipe but it seems to work well thank you so much for Real sharing pleasure. your stories thank with you, us thank today you, thank you it's and, great to um, be thanks for the beer and also for um being part of ivw as well no it's a pleasure um it's you good. know it's i think it like i said it makes a big difference when um large 
companies decide to get involved with initiatives like IVW and support them in you know I, I, in any way I, yeah, they can. I, I think yeah, I was seduced by. By, by Sybil and I think what did it she invited me to the office in Soho which and as soon as I walked in I realised you had fans yeah it was awesome. it's, I went, with due respect to Sybil and it, it, I would, it, I wouldn't, it's not normal business yeah you strike me as the kind of person that likes uh, to be able to make a decision on their toes you know that likes to be able to say I like that and I'm just going to do it's, that it's kind of yeah but it comes with experience yeah. and I was thinking about this question as well because and I said this I said this to a colleague not long ago you know years ago I'd ponder and I'd um and ah and I'd, I'd dot every, you know, dot every I and cross every T and I'd just be, you know, absolutely stringent on everything I did. And now I think with experience, you kind of know the answer. Yeah. And sometimes that takes away the challenge and it can get boring mm. because you've seen it before and therefore. But now I think, you know what, I have, but that maybe that guy below me hasn't or that yeah. lady, the girl below me. So basically impart that knowledge on them and then we can look at something else for a business for me now it's passing the knowledge down so we can go forwards into other areas and you know we question you asked me earlier about how many offices we've got and that those the offices are there because we've had the you know that sort of knowledge being pushed through the business has allowed people like me and my colleagues to be more adventurous and go into different territories and learn about new countries yeah because they're all different you know uk is completely different to france to portugal to spain they're all unique market situations technological um situations and uh, you know and I think uh, that's it. Stay light on your toes. Simple yeah. as that, and be open-minded. And oh, just keep well, going. No, Don't yeah, give up. I think that's. I think that's very, very good advice, actually. Well, we do our best. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining Real us pleasure, today. Don. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And thank you for watching, mm. wherever you may be. Um, remember, tomorrow we have we'll be like, we'll be joined by uh, Mark Richardson, who's a drummer from Skunk and Nancy, and also Erica, who is a, an artist as well. And has, they those two have been doing some amazing things during. Um, the pandemic so we're going to have a chat about those um, but to play us out I think Chocolars are going to get set up and yes yeah, so it leaves me just to say thanks for the questions thank you Rob as Real well pleasure. Thanks, Tom. and uh, nice I'll see me. you all tomorrow at the same time thank you thanks for having us Boardroom this is another original song called Days Are Gone <laughs> Sunlight.